Jewelry isn't a gift you give just once. It's a way to remind your loved one of a beautiful moment every time they see it. Blue Nile can help you find the gift that says how you feel and says it beautifully with expert guidance and a wide assortment of jewelry of the highest quality at the best price. Go to BlueNile.com and experience the convenience of shopping Blue Nile, the original online jeweler since 1999. That's BlueNile.com to find the perfect jewelry gift for any occasion. BlueNile.com. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. Recently, I asked Mint Mobile's legal team if big wireless companies are allowed to raise prices due to inflation. They said yes. And then when I asked if raising prices technically violates those onerous two-year contracts, they said, what the f*** are you talking about, you insane Hollywood ass. So to recap, we're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. To get the Crime Writers on After Show right now, go to patreon.com slash partners in crime media. I'm Rebecca Lavoy, and this is Crime Writers On. Crime Writers On is the original true crime review podcast that digs in at true crime, pop culture, other podcasts. And on this episode, a mother, her baby, and the nanny are all slain in L.A.'s Koreatown. Did cultural differences result in the wrong man going to prison? We'll review the podcast, Strangeland. Joining me to get that done and more is true crime author, TV journalist, and host of the These Are Their Stories podcast, my husband. Love of your life. And yes, love of my life, Kevin Flynn. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Rebecca. Also with us is private investigator, certified pet detective, resident cat lady, and author of the best-selling Dead on Deadline, Laura Bricker. Hello, Laura. Hello, Rebecca, and thank you, Crime Writers on listeners, who helped make that best-selling title possible. And finally, our captain of Woke Cynicism, author of the City Trilogy, host of the Strange Arrivals podcast, and our Patreon Deep Dive Book Club podcast host, Toby Ball. Hello, Toby. Hello, Rebecca. All right, so I think we should just go ahead and start our review. Should we just go ahead and do that? Yeah, I'm still blown away by the season finale of of Yellow Jackets. <laughs> <laughs> didn't see it coming. Talking about it. Did not see that coming. No, but no. Wow. I bet Lottie did, though. That was really something, huh, guys? Um, I might have to rewatch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> By well, the way, there is a season two coming, so in case you were yes, wondering. Yes. Yeah. Uh, season two? That's confirmed, yes. yes. Season two is confirmed, yes. yes. And, and and for folks who actually think that we know what we're talking about, we do not, because we take <laughs> both of these episodes on the same night, so we still have not watched. But you know we've been tweeting the fuck out of it. So. As of this taping, we still have not watched uh, the season finale of Yellow Jackets, but um, in the next podcast you hear, which drops this coming Monday, for sure we will be talking about it. All right, let's go ahead and get to our review this episode. Let's go. This friend of mine, her name's Heather, she's a true crime podcast addict. And one day, over lunch in downtown Los Angeles, she said to me, Ben, you have got to meet my friend Leslie. She's got one of the wildest stories I have ever heard. In 2003, Cherise Song was killed execution style in her Los Angeles apartment, along with her nanny and two-year-old son. Suspicion initially turned to the husband or paid assassins, and Koreatown's Miracle Mile Massacre went cold. So it seems like this is the time in the show where we turn to the audience and give you guys a phone number and ask for help if anyone has any information. No. No, it's not. Not by a long shot. Years later, a DNA sample submitted to California's criminal database matched a latex glove from the crime scene. A former neighbor and Ponzi schemer named Robin Cho was interviewed about the killings. How much of the case was driven by the evidence and how much was colored by cultural misunderstandings. I told you I never talked to her. Well, how'd you get you had your DNA get on her? I don't know. How did your what DNA kind of get DNA on the street? In the podcast Strange Land from Western Sound, host Ben Adair and Sharon Choi re examine the triple murder, poking at holes in the evidence and motive. Relying on Choi's extensive knowledge of Korean culture, the podcast ponders whether the right person is in prison for the slayings. 
Spoiler alert, we are going to be talking about plot points from Strangeland. So if you want to remain spoiler free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes to hear our thumbs up or thumbs down reviews. So, Kevin, this has a two person format. Um, right. This podcast, which I actually I don't disagree with the premise of having the two person mm-hmm. format here. I do think it was a good choice to bring in Sharon Choi to do some of the reporting and exp- exploration of this story. Yeah. You know, I think if Ben Adair did it by himself, he doesn't speak Korean. I think that, you know, Sharon was a good choice to bring in. What do you think of the way the podcast set that up? Because I do think this first episode in particular was a little bit stilted in the way that narration was kind of set up in the style of the podcast. Yeah, I do agree that it was excellent to bring her forward, to elevate her within the podcast. She wasn't just like a producer who was doing the work that Ben could not do with the language and with the culture. That elevated the reporting I did not care for the performative nature of that kind of presentation. It does work in some cases, like this Radiolab two-way style, but it seems like it fell a little more into the weekly true crime chat show kind of thing where one person reads their true crime book report and the other one goes, ooh, ah, that's exciting, and it doesn't really do anything for moving the investigation along. But he could not locate these individuals. Hmm, but what about the other stuff in the letter? The all-caps girlfriend who was apparently sent to New York? We'll get to that. Remember, there was a lot of evidence collected at the crime scene. I believe it works like when there's a main host, right? And the host seems to be relying and drawing out the knowledge of the other person, their correspondent or the co-host or whomever, not merely reacting to like a more knowledgeable person of the two. Ben is listed first as the host. I don't know if, you know, it feels like they're equals or whatever because Sharon certainly did the the most of the narrative load. I just can't believe that in episode one, Ben has never seen these crime photos. Oh, no, he had. had. So (laughs) to be like, oh, wow, look at this, you know, it just, it just was insincere. Yeah, that, hey, Rebecca, (laughs) I'd like you to go out and do some research. And when you come back in five minutes, we'll talk about what you found. Yeah. That, How does that sound, Rebecca? That was not great. I mean, she was in Korea and he was in the United States. It was difficult for me to believe that she would have the materials and he would not. That was not well done. That's 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 be straight. I think that there could have been some transparency there. I didn't mind the transparency at the beginning where he was just like, here's who she is. I'm bringing her in for this reason because she knows more about it than I do. And I honestly think it would have been better suited to just say, she speaks the language, I don't. So I thought she'd be a great partner in this. Like, I think we could have stopped it there because there were times where their interactions were fine and her knowledge and her ability to translate, to talk about the cultural differences and to sort of elevate the conversation were fantastic. But the back and forth just because they were both there stuff didn't work for me at all. Toby, did you feel that that weighed the show and the story down for you as well? Yeah, it just seems, it seemed forced. Uh, It at times seemed scripted. It may not have been, but it just didn't feel natural. Yeah. It's good when it works well. And we have seen a lot of examples, like going back to, what was the Eat the Rich one about the Liberty University? What was that one? Uh, God We Lust? You know, where it just, it just comes off really poorly. Hmm. Well, I, for one, do think this is a very interesting case, even insofar as like the crime scene and, you know, the what the police find by itself. You right. know, we have here an interesting set of circumstances. We have the nanny is murdered and the two year old is murdered. And the way the evidence looks is that the mother came home later. She was tied up and murdered as well. So I think that there is a case to be made here that while the husband is a likely suspect, would he have, for instance, just killed his wife or would he have murdered the nanny and his own kid and then waited a while for his wife to come home? I mean, it is a strange set of circumstances that I think reasonably points to perhaps a higher killer. the wife. Yes, a higher killer or a professional killer. Do you understand why perhaps they looked in that direction? I do. I do. I'm always kind of rolling my eyes about it. It was a hired assassin because it. I just just because most homicides are not, you know, these kinds of transactions. Yeah. Right. Certainly, if you, you have to pay an assassin quite a bit of money, if you can find one. No, you and don't. So, 
You don't? No. They do it for nothing? No, you It's can, a pro bono killing? I'll kill your nanny pro, and the two-year-old? It's not pro year old. bono, but you, you don't right. have to pay somebody as All much right. as you well, think anyway, you that, to That's kill not the most interesting. You have to think about the victimology, right? Right. Who was the actual target of this homicide? Because you have two different sets of victims, really. Yeah. You've got the nanny and the baby. And who would kill a baby as part of the plan? Right. Maybe, and, I don't unless, think it was part of the plan. Well, yeah. right. Unless that's, you know, it's a rage thing and it's like, I'm going to annihilate the family kind of thing. But yeah, the whole different kind of scene, that's very peculiar. And it's one of the things that works against the state's theory of the motive that this was a financial crime, you know, it was a, a, a robbery or, you know, some kind of maybe extortion for money, whatever it is. It just doesn't seem to play based on the profile of the of the killer here. It also doesn't seem to play because all the money and all the valuables are still left right. in the house. Yeah. yeah. So, Laura, what do you think about the fact that there was this anonymous note that was sent that said, you know, the husband had affairs and that he wanted the wife gone and that you should look at these other two people? Is that suspicious or is that a red herring? I don't know. I mean, I always kind of love an anonymous note in a clue, <laughs> whether it has a meaning or not. I can't help but being drawn into the story. But it's it's not just an anonymous note. It's like it makes it sound like we've got like the South Korean mafia or something coming to like kill these people. Like, well, there's some professionals. They've been hired. They've been hired by the husband. They're making room for the girlfriend. And then that they come up with these like fake names on the letter. Scott Song, Jay Lee. And, you know, so obviously the prosecutors are saying that it is Cho that sent this letter. But I, I just think it's a red herring. It wasn't, by the way. That typewriter thing was fucking bullshit. Yeah. No, I think it's a red herring. <laughs> uh-huh. I just have to go back for a minute to say that I have a hard time connecting with so much of the story just because the narration is so stilted throughout the whole thing that I think I missed half of the story of this podcast because I was so annoyed at this, like, fake narration style that was going on. But... I did enjoy the anonymous letter. Yeah. So, Toby, I have a question for you, just to sort of a crime sort of like ethics like thing that I really struggle with, because even though I do want crimes to be solved, California apparently has this law where if you get arrested for anything or almost anything like your DNA is taken and it get entered, get, gets you know put on file and then compared with the whole database. Right. So Robin Cho gets arrested for this, these financial crimes his DNA is entered in the database. It hits for these old murders from five years ago. So then he's arrested for these murders. I want people to get caught for murders. But at the same time, I sort of feel like this sort of like sweep. I That makes me How's sort that of, different than fingerprints. I just I don't know. It's something I'm about that makes me like uncomfortable. Maybe it's just because we just listen to suspect. Mm-hmm. And in this podcast, one of the things that that is strange to me about it, and I let me just say this right now. I had questions about what, for me, were some whole evidentiary holes in the podcast. So I reached out to Ben Adair when I finished listening to it and asked him some questions. And I realized that a lot of my questions about the podcast were related to the fact that we just listened to Suspect. Mm -hmm. And for me, DNA is no longer, like especially this kind of DNA, like these trace evidences of DNA, like on little things, is no longer like the lock and key, throw them away thing that it used to be. And so... I am like now have weird feelings about that. You know what I mean? Does does that make sense? Or am I being like anti catch the killer when I say something like that? Both. Um, No, I I, I think, yeah. Well, first of all, it's just weird that if you get arrested that it happens, you don't have to be convicted. So it's like this like innocent until proven guilty. Well, we will consider you innocent, but we're still taking your DNA. I think the other thing about DNA is that it kind of feels like, you know, especially what we know now about DNA and and how it's not like they keep trying to say where it doesn't lie and, and all this stuff that, in fact, can be very misleading, but it just seems like you're casting this huge net. It's just like, is there anything that you could possibly be involved in? Whereas it seems like fingerprinting sometimes, for whatever reason, it seems more localized. I mean, it, you might catch something else, but that seems more with the case at hand in some ways. Maybe I'm wrong on that. Anyway, for somebody, especially if you're found not guilty or it doesn't really go anywhere, your case doesn't really go anywhere and they figure out they made a mistake, but your DNA is still out there. 
And I guess people would say, well, if you didn't commit any crimes, you don't have anything to worry about. But that's not actually not true. You went to a party where a crime was committed and, you know, you grabbed a beer and you realized it wasn't yours and you put it back down. And then the guy who was actually drinking it does something and you're screwed. Look, the, the California justice system does not come off real great in this. And I'm not sure that they necessarily like the, the case is interesting. And I, and I don't think you can feel really strongly uh, about who did it at the end. I mean, it seems like it's a it's a continuing mystery, but the sort of peak you get at police at the fucking district attorney is nuts. Like that guy is ridiculous. It doesn't matter if he's innocent. It doesn't matter if he's guilty. The defense attorney's job is to do what that client wants. The district attorney is unique. We have a different role. My job is to seek truth and justice. If that tr truth and justice leads towards innocence, then we don't proceed the case. We let the person out. We would never, ever go forward on a case we didn't think that there, the person wasn't guilty. I'm like, dude, do you have any like self-awareness of what you're doing with your life? Like, do you really believe that? Or is this sort of bluster that you think people are going to buy? That, that guy's a jackass. I'm not buying it, Toby. Laura, isn't, but how is this collecting your DNA, keeping it on file, and comparing it to other crime scenes? How is that different than getting your fingerprints taken when you're arrested? I don't see the difference. Well, in this case, I, I mean, the whole, like, keeping your DNA on file and comparing it, I guess, I, I, just speaking to the DNA in this case, I still have a hard time with the ending where we go through the whole thing with, the hair samples and we had the hair samples on file and we're going to do this different sort of DNA test. And we're like, Oh, pubic hair. I'm like, yeah, no kidding. Cause it's like their bathroom. Of course, you know, <laughs> there's some pubes in there, but also it doesn't negate the fact that we have chose DNA on these gloves. And I just can't kind of get past that when I think about this case. And I think that's part of one of the issues that I have with this podcast is we have 10 episodes we know that the Innocence Project is getting this case. And yet, um, again, I'm, I'm a little bit like I kind of tune out because I get annoyed at the narration style. But when we get to the big reveal where it's like, oh, um, well, these hairs are the victims and these hairs aren't chose. But I'm like, well, but his DNA is still on the glove. I mean, but I also, you know, um, and this is totally not what your question was, Kevin, but this is something that I'm kind of stuck on in this podcast is also, you know, I am just stuck on, I just can't really get on board with this motive of like, oh, well, it was like a robbery gone awry. And then he just like did this like crazy tie him up in the, you know, it, it doesn't fit, but there's no other explanation to me that's presented that really seems plausible. And so I, I really don't know what to think about this case. I wish I had a little bit more information about what it was that the Innocence Project was latching onto. And they may have said that. I might have missed it because I was tuning half of it out. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. Jewelry isn't a gift you give just once. It's a way to remind your loved one of a beautiful moment every time they see it. Blue Nile can help you find the gift that says how you feel and says it beautifully with expert guidance and a wide assortment of jewelry of the highest quality at the best price. Go to BlueNile.com and experience the convenience of shopping Blue Nile, the original online jeweler since 1999. That's BlueNile.com to find the perfect jewelry gift for any occasion. BlueNile.com. You can live out your MasterChef dreams. When you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Inside to outside. Repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that.
Hey, I'm going to interrupt. It's time for the business section. All right, Kevin, should I start that music? Yeah. Okay, so here we are in the business section. See, I know you weren't paying attention to this, but I was. All right, so Kevin, what do we have going on in our Patreon right now? We have the latest Deep Dive Book Club podcast. Okay, Toby- what's going on in that? Well, you should know you were on it. Oh, I was. That's right. It was mad. Yeah, yeah. Toby, tell us about, um, just briefly tell us about the discussion you had about Anthony Horowitz's book, A Line to Kill. Um, well, it quickly went off the rails. <laughs> yeah, uh, it did. I'm not saying Rebecca was the cause of this, but yes, she was. was. <laughs> she was in on it, uh, as was uh, Janet Farney and Shirley Lero. Yeah, it was fun. It was a little bit different than the usual deep dive. We talked about the book for about as long as the book deserved to be talked about, and then uh, we <laughs> yeah. talked about a bunch of other random stuff. Yeah, better Anthony Horowitz books. And the, you, yeah, you exactly. Got into. Yeah, yeah. So, Kevin, you edited that podcast. Yes. Are we describing it accurately when we say it went off the rails? It did, but I mean, look, look, I really like Toby's Deep Dive Book Club because it's a lot like a book club. Yes. You know, sometimes you like the book and you can't stop talking about all the great things, and sometimes you're like... Yeah, it was good, but it reminded me of this other thing, and tell me more about Avatar. Sometimes you like the people, and you just want to talk to the people yeah. about all the stuff that the book makes you think about, and that's kind of what it was. It was great. Yeah. It's a pretty loose ship on the deep dive. Yeah. We uh, marked a milestone with our last Married With podcast. We did? It was officially our 250th podcast on Patreon. Really? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Forgot to mention that. So I have a question. Yeah. If somebody signs up for Patreon today, yeah. either like they sign up for like a year subscription or they just sign up at like the five or level, six yeah. bucks a month or whatever. So six bucks a month is when they get all the stuff, right? Well, they get for five dollars a month. They belong to the exclusive content club and they get all of the podcasts except for those at the six dollar level, yes. which also get uh, the uh, Leave it to Bricker podcast. Right. So if they so, sign up at six dollars a month, you get all four extra podcasts we make back there and you get the 250 we've already made. Right. Okay, so you're not just getting future ones, you're getting all the- Is this a math quiz or something? No, I'm asking- This is like a word problem. Yeah. I'm asking because I am not a patron (laughs) of my own show. It just shows up in your feed. Yeah, 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 so I'm just asking, so you get all of the stuff. So joining now is even a better deal than it was like a year ago. Absolutely. (laughs) Okay, that's the question I had. Okay, cool. Absolutely. And and if you subscribe at the annual level, you'll save 10%. Oh, really? Really. That's an awesome deal. Okay. All right, so Kevin, do we have any Patreon patron saints of the week this week? Our Patreon patron saints are Robin Ross and Aaliyah Renee Capodici. Bless you. You, you stepped them up, bless you. Bless you. Fine. Go Bring ahead. The angels. <laughs> Fine. I'm going to fade out the music. There. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you guys about what I talked to Ben and Dare about because now right. it actually is relevant to this. So first of all, I don't think, I'm just going to say it, I don't think the DNA on the gloves means anything. On the gloves? I don't think it means anything. Once you hear the DNA expert talk about what it was that she actually tested, I don't think it means anything. She was not testing. Remember, she was testing something years after the evidence was collected, okay? She was not testing a glove found at the crime scene. She was testing a tiny fragment of gloves found at the crime scene. There were many fragments found at the crime scene. She was not given all of the samples. She had five samples. Some of them did not come out conclusively. One of the little samples came out with a little piece of DNA on it. This is not significantly different from the evidence we heard tested in the case at the heart of suspect, right? Well, This is a piece of material in a building where a lot of people lived And this guy's DNA was on it. We don't know that other people's DNA was not on it. We just know that his DNA was on it. Correct. We do know that he said he wears gloves in this building. Okay. we don't know that this glove, this little tiny fragment piece of glove was not picked up by this piece of tape. Some other way. We don't know. It was about fingertip size. It wasn't tiny, tiny. Do we know that this piece that we know this roll of tape wasn't also stored in this garage near this in the in the trash where this guy threw away his gloves? Do we not know that this this pair of gloves wasn't in the garage and the killer picked them up? I don't think that this touch DNA thing is as important as you guys are putting on it, especially when you hear the method with which she tested. She was not the direct examiner of the evidence there. This was like a game of telephone evidence testing situation. So that being said, this was the glaring hole that I heard in the podcast. 
There was another very big piece of evidence at the crime scene, which was a piece of tape with a palm print on it. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you think there would be DNA on that piece of tape with the palm print? Right. They took in a bunch of pattern experts to look at the palm print, Correct. right? That was the crazy thing. But... And I just kept thinking, like, where's the fucking DNA on the palm print? So you found something out. I did. I contacted Ben Adair. I asked him this question. I said, this seems like it's missing for me. Would you mind like, telling me what's up with that? And he told me they were not able to confirm this before the podcast was published, and they are not going to be able to publish another episode. And he like gave me permission to share this with you. They were able to confirm that the tape was tested for DNA before the trial. They did find DNA on the tape. It did not match Robin Cho, and it did not match the husband. So that was not withheld from the defense, so it was not a Brady violation, but the defense lawyer did not bring it up at trial. So there is DNA at the crime scene that is associated with the palm print on a piece of tape that does not match Robin Cho. I think that is far more fucking important than a little piece of potential touch DNA on a piece of tape that was on somebody's mouth at a crime scene. I'm sorry, I just do. That is an incredible statement. Why? It was found on the victim's mouth. It wasn't a partial smudged fingerprint. It was his DNA. Right, no, I know that was inside So you're gonna say, then you have to say it was his glove. But we don't know if there were Wait, other people's understood? DNA in it. It could have been, Wait, could have sure. been she but, said some but, people but, are shatters, some but, people are not shatters. But because it was his DNA. Yes. We know it had to be wasn't. his glove. But we know it had to be his glove. See, that's still a very hard thing to get around. I so understand what if it was his glove. I understand that, you know, the problems with the rest of the case. I want to feel like maybe he didn't do it, but there doesn't seem to be a good way to disprove that. Okay. I just the, don't I just don't think the DNA well, is as important as you're making it. I well, just don't. The DNA is the thing that got him convicted. Okay, but what if the Everybody D- says that. What happens when someone else's match comes up and the DNA matches the tape? Is that person equally guilty to Robin Show to you? The the counter argument could be there was more than one killer. Okay, just like with oh, okay, now you're in the same category as you were. We're not talking about a mix. We're talking about a separate thing. No, no, no. I'm saying No, this it's is a good e- argument. But this is exactly like the suspect case, right? Every time they'd find somebody's DNA, they'd be like, well, maybe they did it together. So now they have two people's DNA. Obviously, they went to the parking lot and talked about music, and then they plotted it together. Okay, who's going to make a deal first? Stop we'll turn comparing that guy- it to, to suspect. It's, it's not a different dis- case. Not dissimilar. It's not dissimilar. It's like, it, let's pick it is somebody. But it, but it doesn't... So I, I get where you're going. I don't think because it was wrong in the suspect necessarily means it's wrong here. I mean, in this one, there's no reason why Robin Cho would be in this person's house right there's right. not there's not a chance for it accidentally to get there what you're basically saying is somehow this person picked it up probably in the garage because yeah, they don't maybe. live on the same floor but i mean that to me seems like a little bit of a, a stretch like i i you know i don't know that might Isn't be enough a stretch to keep... if it's the husband or if the husband hired somebody and the guy and the person used the husband you know, i mean there's a, it's not impossible it's just not right but that's not the that's not what you're trying to prove. It's like reasonable doubt. Like, I, I think I think there's plenty of reasonable doubt, and I'm not 100%. It's hard to explain away the DNA, but again, I don't, based on this podcast, I think I'd have a hard time convicting because there seems like there's other stuff that kind of goes against it. And then, you know, you do have to weigh pros and cons. And I, and I do think, you know, juries, I think, think that DNA is this like... Magic infallible yeah. you know the dna's there so you got to convict them as a matter of fact that's what the police are saying but you know it's a tough one I, I mean it's it's tough and i you know for robin cho if he in fact didn't do it he must be like what the hell you know yeah. how did this happen and he says basically in those in those interrogations he's like i don't know i don't know i didn't do it i don't know how it got there i didn't do it and it's like what else what else can he say yeah so I do want to talk about the interrogation because I do think it is the the heart of the podcast. And if we're going to talk about the strongest part of the podcast, it is the strongest part of the Agreed. podcast. So, Kevin, let's talk about that scene because okay. it is a, it, it's it's the meat. And we have a great analyst kind of breaking it down for us. So would you what, were, what are your thoughts about this? The, these two interrogation scenes? Okay, w- One thing which is not insignificant is the quality of this audio, because we hear a lot of different podcasts like interrogation stuff and it's just all like oh, hollow white noise and it's hard to hear this. You could hear everything really well, which made you follow along. Right. It's like, it's like they knew they were going to make a podcast out of the interrogation. Yeah, right. <laughs> they could have like I didn't need to hear them like asking, you know, your mother's name and stuff like that. They could have like, you know, tightened that up a bit. 
But it was great to kind of follow along and see where it's going. And then to have this third observer, this outside observer, their analyst who's watching what happens, provided really great context to what you're hearing. Unfortunately for me, I couldn't tell whether, and it was clear that the cops were not doing things, you know, in the best way possible. But I couldn't tell whether or not that meant that they just weren't going to be able to get him to confess to his guilt or whether that just meant that they're looking at the wrong guy. Like, what are the consequences of this incompetence, right? We have DNA from the victim, Mrs. Therese Song, Mm -hmm. your DNA on our victim. How can, okay. How can it do no, I'm just telling you, your DNA is on our victim. That's why you're here. You're not leaving here today. Yeah. So, Toby, one of the things that I liked about the interrogation scenes and one of the reasons I did like there being more details in there about like the protracted scenes, I thought and this is where I think the podcast could have been a lot stronger is the cultural problems is the reason why this case went off the rails. And I think that if the podcast leaned into that more, this is why this is the strongest part of the podcast. When Sharon points to the translation issue with the bicycle, when Robin says it's the space where people keep bicycles and then the cops go and ask his wife, do you have a bicycle? Because that is the example he gave. And she says no. And then they think that's an example of him lying. It is just a really strong case to make that that interrogation sent his case off the rails because of a language barrier. What did you think about that and how the podcast used it and and just that those scenes in general? So I thought the interrogation was interesting, largely because they have that analysis by that guy who kind of talks about how you should be doing interrogations and why the interrogation that they're doing is not very effective. That to me was a frustration on the part of the detective who has to do something to alleviate his own stress. And that is stand up, I'm gonna pat you down. I appreciated that they spent a little bit of time on uh, the cultural thing. Like I understand why they set up the season the way they did. Like it, it makes kind of logical sense in that they they talk about the crime, then they talk about the case against Robin Cho, and then they talk about the holes in the case, and then this sort of resolution with the DNA stuff. There's enough twisting and turning of things that you find out about, like, the Ponzi scheme that, in fact, turns out not really to be a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. And there's, you know, just these different things they find with the evidence. Um, and then you also have layered onto that this sort of these cultural differences, this cultural misunderstandings. And then this Robin Cho just being kind of a weird dude in general that I think if they'd set it up more, I think they could have done a very serialish kind of thing where episode by episode, you're kind of getting a different viewpoint on what happened. And and so you're, it's more of a roller coaster in terms of how you're perceiving the case. Cause I think there's a lot of different things to look at. And in some ways, I wish they'd done it that way, because I I think it could have really been one of those ones where after every episode, you're like, huh, like, I don't feel the same way about the case now than I did an episode before. But the way this was kind of set up, like, you know, he's in jail from the very get go. And so, you know, that they're going to try and call this into question, right? I mean, that's the only reason why you're going to do this podcast. So I think that kind of takes some of the, the suspense away. The case is super interesting. I mean, I I, I thought the facts about Rafat were, were really, in some cases, fascinating. In other cases, just kind of interesting. And then I thought they were smart, for the most part, about the experts they brought in. I, I felt like, I don't know if they brought in like six or seven experts, but I thought like maybe four of them, like really added quite a bit to my understanding of what was going on. I could have done with a little bit less understanding about DNA. Like that, I was just like... <laughs> Like, I feel like I know some of this stuff, but the stuff that I don't know, I don't feel like I really need to. (laughs) I could have Um, used a counter expert there, too. I just felt like we were, I I really, I could have. I mean, I felt like we're talking to the lab lady who works for the state. I could have used a counter expert there. I I don't think talking to the person who made the evidence who works for the state that was used at trial, I don't think it was, I think we should have used somebody else. Yeah, no, but that was the that was the that was the evidence that was used. Yeah, and I, I yeah. think that we should well, have she had. Didn't work for the state, but I know. She you know was what I mean? There. Yeah, yeah. So, Laura, I have one question for you. 
Okay. Were you wondering why they never followed up on why he threw the bullets in the trash? Because I was. Yeah. I mean, I understand you just talked to the cops. Maybe you want to get rid of some suspicious shit that's in your car. But isn't that a question that you were curious about the answer to? Yeah, because, you know, so we begin, we have him brought in for questioning. In the beginning, he's just a neighbor. No big deal. We know he did this Ponzi scheme, uh, yada, yada. And then they're like, oh, okay. They let him go. But then we find out he's dumps the packages in the trash cans. The cops go. They find these five live 38 caliber rounds. These match the murder weapons. What the heck? I mean, that to me is one of the most suspicious details we hear in this whole podcast. And yes, I would like to know why, what's going on. What's the story with this? I think it's because he told the cop he didn't have a gun and he realized he lied and he just wanted to get rid of the, or he realized that he had the bullets. I just, yeah. I just, I just, I, I don't know. I just don't He just think... panicked. Maybe he just panicked. It was like and he five was like, years oh. later. You really think those those bullets were tied no. to a gun that he may have? No. <laughs> the whole thing yeah. was just, but I do agree with what you're saying. I mean, about the, the interview of him and, and the tapes being the most illuminating part of this, because we can hear this ongoing back and forth dialogue. And so like a lot of his behavior just doesn't make sense to me, including the dumping the bullets in the trash. Yeah. So, well, if he had, um, if he were the killer and he got rid of the gun five years ago, but he still had ammunition because he didn't <laughs> use all of it, he might be like, well, how do I explain that I have ammunition and no gun? I have to get rid of the, the ammunition. Whole, Just a I thought. Guess. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but also, wasn't that a great scene, though, when he wrote on the piece of paper? I didn't oh, yeah. do oh. it. Oh, I love the clip where the detective says, would you write it down for me? Yes what you did and he gives him the pad and I'm watching Cho and I'm going anybody who can't see this coming is blind to what's happening in the room and I'm watching as he writes and I can literally see him write I didn't do it <laughs> we all just fucking saw that yeah. coming I, I can't believe the cop didn't see that coming <laughs> that, that, that also eroded my confidence in his being able to solve any kind of case yes I mean, the best part about it, too, was that we know that Robin Cho, we, we know that English is not his first language and that he's like really sort of struggling to understand some of the questions they're asking. Yeah. And then yeah. he had the wherewithal just to be like, I did not do it. I'm like, you go, Robin Cho, because I <laughs> yeah. don't fucking and, think you did it either. <laughs> well, but you can tell that in listening to those tapes, because it's like every question they ask, he like repeats it back to them because he actually just really doesn't totally understand what the question is. Yeah. And that's very clear. Yeah. You know, one thing that occurred to me is that that analyst, I forget his name, but he said he, at the end, after watching it, he came to the conclusion that that sounds, he looks like an innocent guy to me. And one of the reasons he said was, he said, I didn't do it. You know, if, if you've done it, you ask, well, why would you think it was me or something like that, yeah. right? Yeah. Which again, I think is an example of cultural misunderstanding. It's very likely that he phrased that the way he did, because that is his understanding of English. Yeah. You know, the cop made a cultural assumption. No, 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 they say it this way when it means this. That's a good and point. then again, if the whole point of it is like, you don't understand this Korean gentleman, then sometimes it's the same thing. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. When you're ready to pop the question, the last thing you want to do is second guess the ring. At BlueNile.com, you can design a one-of-a-kind ring with the ease and convenience of shopping online. Choose your diamond and setting. When you found the one, you'll get it delivered right to your door. Go to BlueNile.com and use promo code WELCOME to get $50 off your purchase of $500 or more. That's code WELCOME at BlueNile.com for $50 off your purchase. BlueNile.com, code WELCOME. You can start your day off right. When you find a professional on Angie to get your plumbing right first. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that. We heard Ben and Sharon uh, do some supposition on, on their own, like what they thought 
What do you guys think? I don't think he did it. I understand you have a hard time getting past the DNA. I just, I have learned to be more suspicious of that tiny, tiny trace amounts of touch DNA that could have, I, I agree that the glove belonged to him. I just think that like the trail from the glove, a piece of glove ending up on a piece of tape that had somebody else's fucking DNA on it does not, to me, make a person go away for life. So I, and I, I'll just, I just don't think he did it. The motive isn't there for me. So um, I say no, Kevin, what do you say? I say, well, the more I talk about it, the more I think yes, but I really want it to be disproven, but it just, it just, like everybody said in the podcast, that DNA, no matter how small it is, that is hard to look past. Mm. That is hard to look past. Laura's nodding. Laura's nodding. So I guess she agrees, right, Laura? Yeah. And I, I hate to, I hate to agree on this, but the, the motive makes no sense. None of that makes any sense. But I guess I'm just, I'm struggling with, I don't have another explanation or theory of the case that makes more sense to me. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't. Than this. You wouldn't. If you, but, if you didn't know who did it, you wouldn't. Yeah, but it just, it doesn't make any, <laughs> I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense because I'm like, the motive is, oh, okay. So uh, he went into the apartment to look for money. You know, she walks in, she surprises him. He's like, oh shit, I kill her. But then he just panics and leaves without taking anything. I mean, I guess on one hand, yeah, he panics and leaves because he's like, oh, shit, I killed people. But on the other hand, oh, shit, I killed people is a spur of the moment killing people, not a I'm putting like duct tape over somebody's face and like doing this elaborate killing. So I, I just don't really know what to think, but I don't feel like I left this with enough of a skepticism about the case in terms of but also like giving me another option of something to latch on to. Toby. I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I just, you know, I think there's compelling evidence that he did do it. And I think if somebody was like, you can decide whether he goes to jail or not based on this podcast, I think I'd have a hard time <laughs> sending him to jail. But uh, it's, uh, you know, justice reform. It's going to be all podcasts. <laughs> it's, it's, doesn't, it's not a great look for him, but. I mean, he just seems like kind of a weird guy, you know? I mean, he what did he he's going around dumping stuff and in addition to his like bullets, he also dumps like a taco or something. I mean, it's just it all seems <laughs> <laughs> Who dumps a taco? It just seems yeah. very, we never dump tacos. He's going to jail just for that. Yeah, I that's a crime of the week right there, Toby, yeah. dumping a yeah. taco. Yeah. So I don't know. I just in some ways I'd want him to be innocent just to spite that DA. But, I will just say, for the record, every time you say something like, if he didn't do it, then I don't know what happened, is exactly what the hell people say about a non say it. If he didn't do it, then what the hell oh, happened? Oh, Rebecca, you're trying too hard. I don't think you did it. All I'm right. sorry, but you're let's, trying too hard. Let's do what we do. <laughs> Should people check out Strangeland? It's a new podcast from Western Sound. Laura Bricker, what do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down for Strangeland? Uh, so, okay. I think if you are a person that <laughs> likes... <laughs> <laughs> hey, what about you, Larry? What about you? <laughs> Are you okay, this kind so of person? I did not like this podcast. So that's a thumbs down and for you. This is a thumbs down for me <laughs> because I could not get past the writing and the narration style in this podcast. It, for me, took away from the flow of the story, the suspense of the story, the engagement of the story because I was so distracted by the fake back and forth discussion between the two hosts that I could not focus on the story. However, if you are a person who wants to hear every single detail of what's in the police reports and hear all the witnesses and the experts, they had good experts, they had good information. But for me, that all fell flat because I just could not get past the style that this podcast was written in. Um, so for me, I'm sorry, it's a thumbs down. Toby Ball. I'm going to pull a Rebecca and, and sort of, I wish they'd talk to me before they put this together because I feel like the, the <laughs> stuff that's there is, it's an interesting case. They've got good experts. There's a lot of good stuff there. I don't think the format that they use with this, this sort of weird two people talking or, or whatever is super effective. And then I just think the way it's arranged, which you know, makes logical sense to me and I think looks good on paper. There's so many kind of twists and turns and, and, and things in this case that I think 
if they'd laid it out a little bit differently, there would have been sort of this more like, I got to hear the next episode. I got to hear the next episode. Wow. I wasn't thinking about like when the last episode ended, I was thinking this. Now, after this episode, I think another way. I think that there was all the possibility for that. But I think the way it's kind of set up doesn't allow that to happen as much. That being said, I think it's a good case. They've got some interesting experts. I'm sort of in between a thumb sideways and a mild thumbs up. I mean, I didn't mind listening to it. So I guess, I guess I'll give it a, a mild thumbs up, but I think it could have been really good. I think there are just some decisions that were made uh, about format and, and sort of sequencing uh, that weren't the best. Kevin Flynn. I'm going to go thumbs down. I'm disappointed. I like both of these hosts. I think it was a great idea to bring in Sharon in particular because she did bring a lot to this podcast that other podcasters would not. I just sort of think in the end, their conclusions are really underwhelming. The DNA evidence was kind of like, you know, yeah, what were you expecting? And while the setup of the crime and how it relates to the person convicted is really puzzling. This just really didn't move the needle for me on my understanding of the crime and whether I would change what I believe in it. So overall, I was just I just blah uh, on this effort, and I, I hope they try again with something else. I am giving this podcast a thumbs up. I liked the story a lot. I think the case is super fucking interesting, and I think I see more there than you guys do. Sorry. And I'm, I guess Kevin says I keep trying too hard, but I think I do just see more there than you guys do, and which is what made me reach out to Ben and Dare with like a million questions. I, I may just be a little biased because I'm more familiar with Ben's work. Like He made Offshore... Lost Till season one. He's just he's a really talented journalist. And I do agree with you that the choice to bring in Sharon was a good one. I agree with Toby. There are some structural problems here. And it makes me wonder about like production pressures and formatic pressures. Uh, Because it just doesn't seem like it just seems like, you know, you got to make this a certain way in a certain time period in a certain whatever. Like it just it doesn't seem natural. And I the podcast does suffer from that. Like first we're going to do this. Next, we're going to take this case apart and look at whatever. Next, we're going to do this. And it's like the order is right, but it's clunky in that way. And the story suffers from it. For me, what really saves this podcast is the case. The case is just really, really interesting. And the experts are really, really good. Um, I, I just do wish there had been a, a counter DNA thing. And I, I really do wish that the glaring holes they had been able to report out before they published. And the, the podcast suffers there, too. So I'm a, I'm a thumbs up, not hugely enthusiastic but uh, a generally okay thumbs up on the podcast. I think I'm going to do Laura. If you are the kind of true crime fan that uh, just wants to hear about an interesting case and then speculate on whether or not you think somebody did it or not, you probably will like this podcast too. So yeah, thumbs up for me for Strangeland. All right, Laura Bricker, we are going to end it on that note. But before I do, do we have a cat or perhaps a dog of the week this week? (laughs) We have a dog of the week, and this is a dog of the week that is close to the Crime Writers on Family. And I picked it because, number one, it was freaking adorable. Yeah. And number two, it was tweeted out by Toby Ball. It who, was. Like, Toby never gets all gushy like I do about pets and animals. And his sister has this freaking, uh, is it a golden doodle? Yes. This golden doodle named Clancy, who has a little outfit. And I'm sorry, I know she lives in like like Vermont somewhere, but I might have to go take that dog. So, But Toby said he has a really good story about this dog, so I'm going to turn it over to Toby. I'm not sure if it's a really good story, but uh, I haven't been- It's a, a story. It's a story. Uh, yeah, so we went up uh, for, for Does Christmas. Does it involve a tiny horse? It, yeah, there's there's a whole herd of tiny horses up there in Vermont. <laughs> um, we went up to see my sister and my parents for Christmas, And so Clancy was there and they had just gotten him earlier in the week. So he was brand new puppy and was very entertaining. But one of the things my sister was doing was kind of sort of low key, like teaching him to sit. And Mm. so she'd like get him to sit and then she'd give him a treat. And so Clancy's reaction to this would be, my sister would be walking around doing something else and he'd be kind of chasing her in that kind of puppy way where they don't like run exactly in a straight line. He kind of like lists off a little bit to the right, but then yes. he'd catch up and she'd stop and he'd run around in front of her and then sit and like look it up at her, like waiting for his treat. Cause it wasn't like, he just thought every time he sat, he'd get a treat. Not that it was like in a response Aww, to a command. I would 
give him a treat so, every time. Well, He's so I think my cute, I think my Toby. sister. That's may how you have. train dogs. Yeah. treat him every time. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, he was a lot of fun. Like I've never been around a puppy that young. I think, <gasps> and it was also there was a lot of snow, and we went out. It was uh, the Patriots Bills game, and I'm a Bills fan, and my and so is my dad, and everybody else in the family's a Patriots fan. So we did a little. Uh, impromptu tailgating so there are a lot of people walking around in the snow and clancy came out and he's at that age where he like knows where his front paws are going but not where his back paws are going <laughs> so there's a lot of like running around and then like stepping with his back paw into somebody's footprint and like wiping out and then popping back up again and taking off again so he's just, in love yeah you can just kind of hang out and watch him and be entertained for hours oh. Wait till you uh, see Clancy when he gets older and the snow comes out and he comes out and just rolls around in the snow and sticks his head in the snow for no reason because he smells the snow because he smells the water from where the snow used to be before it was snow. Dogs fucking love snow. It is the best. All right, Lara Bricker, if folks want to follow you on Twitter and criticize you for your nepotism and picking this cat of the week this week, how can they find you there? At Lara Bricker. And Toby Ball, folks want to reach out to you, congratulate you on finally, finally becoming a dog person. How can they find you on Twitter? And they can also find a picture of Clancy uh, if they scroll down. Uh, but I'm at Toby Ball and H. They won't regret it. Clancy is pretty goddamn cute. Kevin Flynn, if folks want to reach out to you and tell you how lucky you are to have me, how can they find you on Twitter? No need to do that. I already know. But reach me at Kevin P. Flynn. And if you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram to tell me you agree with me that Robin Cho did not do it, you can find me at Reb Lavoy. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Crime Writers On. And I encourage you to join our incredible community and our official Crime Writers On Facebook discussion group. You can also join our regular old Facebook page, but really you should join the group. Support the show on Patreon.com slash Partners in Crime Media. You'll get the Crime Writers on After Show, Married with Podcast, Lara Bricker's Leave it to Bricker Podcast, and Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club Podcasts. Our theme song was composed and performed by Ty Gibbons. Our line editor is the beautiful and handsome and astute Olivia Burdett. The executive producer of this program is Kevin Flynn. This show was recorded in the yoga loft above the bodega in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi studio, otherwise known as Studio C, the closet in our New Hampshire basement, where we also change our oil while wearing latex gloves. On behalf of all the crime writers, thanks so much for listening. We will catch you later. later. Hey, Toby, you have two Instagram accounts. Which is the correct one? I don't know. There's one that's TobyBall603 and one that's TobyBall. Uh, it's probably TobyBall603. Oh, is it? I keep tagging, like, different Toby Balls because I'm not sure which one is the real Toby Ball. Uh, let me... Oh, Toby Ball has no posts. Hold on. <laughs> Lara's been tagging balls. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh... Hold on, Toby Ball 603. Oh, I guess you are Toby Ball 603. Okay, so you need to get rid of the other one because it's confusing. Get rid of Toby Ball. Okay. Toby Ball needs to die. Toby Ball needs to go in the pit of spikes. For some reason, I've got a picture of me sweaty. I don't know why I've got that. Anyway. <laughs> sweaty ball. <laughs> sweaty ball. <laughs> Jesus. All right. I walked into that. You can live out your master chef dreams when you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Inside to outside, repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that.